Okay, thank you. And can I welcome everyone to this, the 19th and final meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. The first item on our agenda is to consider whether to take agenda item four, consideration of a draft report on PE 1319 on improving youth football in Scotland in private. Is that agreed? Okay. Thank you. The next item is a consideration of two new petitions. The first petition is petition 1713 by Amy Lee Frioli, MSYP, and Kit McCarthy, MSYP, on the ban of the use of mosquito devices in Scotland. Members have a copy of the petition and the briefing prepared by Spice and the Clarts. And we'll take evidence from Kit McCarthy, MSYP. Can I welcome you to the meeting and you have an opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. My name is Kit McCarthy, I am 16 years old and I am one of the two democratically elected members of the Scottish Youth Parliament for North East Fife. The Scottish Youth Parliament is an independent charity representing the views of young people from all backgrounds. My parents recently had a problem with mice in our house. They bought a small device called a sonic rodent repellent. It emits a high-pitched tone that, while inaudible to humans, is painful to the ears of mice, rats, and other vermin. Imagine the same device, but instead of targeted at mice, targeted at children. It's already on the market. It's called the Mosquito, and it's used by shopkeepers, public authorities, transport companies, and others. The Mosquito takes advantage of the fact that hearing deteriorates with age. It can generally only be heard by young people. Initially, the noise is irritating. After a few minutes, it is painful. SYP has been campaigning for a ban since 2010. I will first consider why we object to these devices, and then why we believe a ban is appropriate. The former Director of Liberty, Shami Chakrabarti, describes the effect of a mosquito as follows. At Liberty, we once bought a mosquito to test out its effectiveness. I remember being completely oblivious to it. I was already in my early 30s. Then suddenly, one of our trainee solicitors covered her ears, burst into tears, and ran out of the room in evident agony. Think of the outcry if a device was introduced that caused blanket discomfort to people of one race or sex. However, there is seemingly no issue with a device that targets one age group. Mosquitoes treat even well-behaved young people as no better than rodents. This hardly fosters mutual respect between generations. It just encourages resentment. Discriminatory, demonising treatment will, of course, have a negative, not a positive effect on young people's behaviour. Mosquitoes are counterproductive. They don't prevent antisocial behaviour, they just move it elsewhere. The United Nations, the Council of Europe and the Children and Young People's Commissioners for both Scotland and England have condemned mosquitoes as violations of all of the major human rights instruments. There are also health concerns, and there has not been sufficient research on the safety of these devices. In April 2013, this committee heard a petition PE1367 submitted by Andrew Dean's MSYP, which also called for a ban on mosquitoes. The petition was closed, as both the committee and the government thought there was insufficient evidence to support a ban. Understanding the prevalence of mosquitoes is not straightforward. There are no exact figures on the number of devices in Scotland, or how many are in regular use. In 2013, it was believed that around 200 devices had been sold for use in Scotland. We now have more evidence. A survey this year of 725 young people conducted by Young Scott and commissioned by the Scottish Government received 105 reports of mosquitoes being used. ScotRail has admitted using three units. Freedom of information requests submitted by myself have revealed between five and eight devices in Perth and Kinross, including five on school premises, and four in five, including three on school premises. Following campaigning by SYP, Fife Council, Perth and Kinross Council and ScotRail agreed to remove their mosquitoes and Fife Council has banned them on all public property. But other council's records do not reveal where the units are placed. Moreover, we know that at least 100 mosquitoes have been sold to private users with no record of their positioning. For this reason, further guidance to councils is unlikely to be effective. What is needed is a legislative ban. There is widespread support for such a ban. We want this committee to pressure the government, as a world leader in the protection of human rights, to outlaw these devices without reservation. Thank you for your consideration. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to now move to um, some questions. Can I start by asking you, um, in your petition you indicate that you've continued to raise your concerns 
on this issue directly with the Scottish Government. Can I ask whether this is ongoing and what sort of response you've had from the Scottish Government? The last response we have from the Scottish Government was, I think, in September 2017, where they stated that their position uh, was that while they were opposed to the use of mosquito devices, uh, they didn't believe there was sufficient evidence for a legislative ban. And uh, this position has been repeated multiple times to us in correspondence um, from the Safer Communities Directorate. Sorry, the Community Safety Directorate. Um, when, in January 2018, the Young Scots survey was released, uh, the Scottish Government position changed and they raised the issue that they didn't believe they had competency to legislate on the issue. Thank you very much for that, Angus. <coughs> okay, thanks, convener. Good morning, Kit. Um, the briefing that we have in front of us uh, refers to the SYP's a previous petition, which you, you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, and it outlines why uh, at that time the petition was closed. Um, that was, uh, as you as you will know, because the, the Scottish Government's position was that to legislate for a ban on these devices, there needed to be policy justification based on sound evidence. Uh, and more recently, in September last year, the then Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs stated that she'd written to all local authorities and other stakeholders, including Police Scotland and COSLA, uh, seeking information on their policies on these devices. Um, are, are you aware of uh, whether any such information has since been provided uh, to the Scottish Government? Um, as far as I know, the only information that has been t provided to the Scottish Government has been the Young Scots survey. The other information that is also available is the examples that have arisen with mosquitoes being used by ScotRail, Perth and Kinross Council, Fife Council, uh, and we also, there is, uh, for instance, a confirmed use of a mosquito in Lowburn Shopping Centre at Dumfries and Galloway. Okay. Um, you mentioned ScotRail had removed three devices. How recently was that? Um, that was, I think, was the end of 2017. Okay. Thanks. Um, you refer to calls and evidence from, for example, uh, the, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Council of Europe's Parliamentary uh, Assembly a recommendation from 2010. Um, you also referred to the much more recent advice from the Ministry of Justice in Ireland. Are these matters that you've raised with the Scottish Government? Um, no, as far as I'm aware, not directly. OK. Do you have plans to do that? Uh, as far as I'm aware, yes, we do. OK. Thank you. OK. Um, David? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Kit. Um, your survey that you published, you says there was just over 700 um, young people took part in it. Um, that's not necessarily representative of all the young people in a very small number for Scotland. Can you give me your general thoughts on the findings from the survey and any developments since um, it's been published? Uh, out of 725 respondents, 105 respondents indicated that they had experienced mosquito devices. 85% indicated that they had uh, experienced them on a recurring basis. Uh, that means that 15% of respondents from the survey had come into contact with uh, such a device. Now, the survey admits that it cannot necessarily be considered as representative of all young people in Scotland. However, as described by uh, the survey here, However, the survey provides a snapshot insight into young people's views and experiences and contributes to developing understanding of the overall impact of mosquito devices. Thank you. Okay, but if I read it right, it's 41% or 15% said it's a problem. 41% of it has said they experienced health impacts. 85% said they had experienced mosquitoes on a repeat, recurring basis. Mm -hmm. But not necessarily in a way that had affected them, They're just that they were aware of them. Out of that, uh, there, there is, as far as I'm aware, there is no statistical link between the 41% and the 85%. Uh, they're, they're both separate figures. 85% of respondents, I think... Um, no, they're saying that only 41... 41% 41 of respondents experienced health issues, but that's obviously a separate... 41% oh, or 15%? Yes, so a so much smaller... Much smaller figure. A much smaller figure, There's a yes. general view amongst respondents that they didn't like them, but didn't have any effect on them. Uh, generally, 59% uh, yeah, did not experience health effects. Because okay. I mean, suppose the issue is really the extent to which this sounds as if it's a, a big problem 
You say 85% sounds quite a lot, but if it's 85% of a small number, it's not really very many. There's a separate issue of whether you should do it at all, but I'm wondering whether your findings um, perhaps suggest that the, the issue is not that big an issue for young people? Perhaps. However, we are concerned by the health effects of the devices. The fact that any number of young people indicated that they experienced pain and distress from the use of mosquito devices makes us believe that we have credible grounds to seek uh, further scientific research on the health effects of these devices. There has not been sufficient uh, research onto possible risks. Right, so your, your position would be that before a ban, there should be research to establish whether we need a ban or not? To a, a certain extent, but there is also another aspect to the ban, which is the rights-based issue. Uh, both the Children and Young People's Commissioner for Scotland and the Council of Europe have identified mosquito devices as violating potentially four or five separate rights under the European Convention. And can you explain the point about competence? Why did the Scottish Government think it wasn't competent to? Although um, they've said they want them banned, why would they say they had no legislative competence to do so? The original position was uh, that a ban on mosquito devices would come under trade, which is reserved to Westminster. We would like the issue to be reframed, and we think it should be considered as a health issue, a justice issue, and an equalities issue. And therefore, we believe the Scottish Government does have competence to legislate. Okay, thank you. Um, Brian? Thank you. Good morning, Kent. Just, just a, a, a sort of supplementary to what the convener was saying there around uh, the health, health effects. Just expand a little bit on, on the, the, the health effects that uh, some of the, the recipients received. Okay. So 41% of respondents experienced health effects or discomfort from these devices, and that's 41% out of the 15% that had experienced them. Question is, yeah, sorry. what health effects? So the impacts were, that were reported cover both physical and mental health and can be broadly grouped into the following categories. Headaches and migraines, ear problems including tinnitus, dizziness or nausea, and anxiety and panic. Um, anxiety and panic was experienced by 5%, dizziness and nausea by 20%, tinnitus, hearing uh, issues and earache, 48%, and headaches by a majority, 68%. Okay, thank you. Um, you also, in your petition, uh, you mentioned the FOI requests that you submitted to all local authorities and, and uh, you noted that, with, that you had some success uh, that had been achieved through those requests. I think you referred to Fife Council um, and Perth and Kinross Council. What if you give, give us an update on uh, uh, those two areas and whether you anticipate any of the other local authorities or I think you think are prepared to follow suit and and, uh, and give you some uh, and reply to your FOI requests? Um, sorry, can you repeat the second half of your question? So I was just I mean, if you give me an update to, to, to the two areas you mentioned, which was uh, Fife Council, Perth and Kinross, and if you anticipate other local authorities uh, following their lead and, and replying to your FOI request. Fife Council, uh, in response to the freedom of information requests that we submitted and our further campaigning, the council uh, issued an uh, outright ban on the devices being used on council property. Perth and Kinross Council, as far as I'm aware, has removed the devices um, from schools across Perth and Kinross, but I do not believe that they have issued a full, an, a full ban. Since then, we've had no further contact with either council. Or well, any of the other councils that, you've, that, that perhaps that you've written to, are you expecting any reply from them? No, we haven't, we haven't had a response from any other councils. The only other usage of a mosquito that was reported through free, Freedom of Information was in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and that was by a private operator. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Morning, Kit. Uh, I'm interested in the, in the part of the survey that says that most of young people surveyed had not heard of mosquito devices. Um, I wondered how extensively um, people, people had understood um, the, the, the actual survey that was done um, and the groups that were reached, and in particular, um, groups such as um, those with um, autism. And in the evidence, um, it says that harmful devices are exacerbated when experiences experienced by young people with protected characteristics. Um, it also goes on to state evidence from Jenny Patterson, uh, who is um, she's a director of the National Autistic Society, 
And I want to quote this because she says, many autistic people have very sensitive hearing, experience sensory challenges and struggle with social anxiety, as well as being painful to hear the sudden high-pitched buzz of the mosquito device to further increase social isolation we know autistic people face by making them feel unable to access the public spaces that many of us take for granted. Now, I just wondered if, first of all, the Scottish Government survey reached those types those, those people um, who have protected characteristics. Um, and secondly, do you have any further comment um, and more information uh, regarding uh, the, the effects and, and, and just any other information that you have? Um, the survey did not cons uh, ask respondents to state if they had any particular disability or autism specifically. So the survey can't comment on that directly. Um, in terms of the autism, I personally am autistic and can testify that um, the sound of the, the tone produced by mosquitoes is, has a horrific effect. Uh, and I know that other people I've, I have reproduced the sound to with autism have found uh, similarly. So do you think the fact that um, in the first place people haven't heard of the mosquito devices that they're actually unaware that they're experiencing what they're experiencing. Well, this is something I've wondered about. I think it's possible that a higher number of young people have experienced mosquitoes, but due to being unaware that they uh, were a device in use, uh, then would have responded in the negative to that question in the survey. Okay. So do you think that the survey has been left wanting in terms of its uh, detail? Possibly. Yes. Okay, and just one more question on the local authorities, which Brian was touching on um, with regards to the response. Uh, do you intend to follow that up? Do you intend to follow up um, the requests, the FOI um, requests to the local authorities that didn't respond? And why do you think that you got such a low response? Do you believe that the local authorities haven't responded because they're not using those devices? All of the local authorities and indeed the transport companies that we also direct the Freedom of Information requests to responded within the statutory time frame. Um, the vast majority said either that they held no records or that they were not aware of the use of mosquito devices. Um, what this suggests to us um, is that there are, um, on, on the basis of the reports received by the survey, that most mosquito devices are used by private operators. We have, at the moment, no specific intentions to follow up any of those freedom of information requests with the councils, because we're not sure that there is further information they can provide us. OK, last point, convener. Do you think that mosquito devices should be registered if a private uh, company is putting them in place, but not then, uh, and then the local authority don't have any data or they're not actually aware of where they are um, or how they're being used, or the effects of them? Due to the rights-based considerations, we want to see an outright ban. However, if the Scottish Government didn't consider there was sufficient evidence um, for a legislative ban, we would welcome any form of regulation on the devices, as indeed would uh, the device's inventor in his evidence to the committee in 2012, I think. Um, so yes, I, I have to be slightly careful here because SYP does not have formal policy on alternative measures to an outright ban on mosquito devices. But as far as I'm aware, SYP would support it further regulation if legislative ban was not considered appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Uh, David? Thank you. Um, returning to his research published in January, one of the points it makes is that the use of devices is not an effective deterrent. How would you respond to people who might suggest that if it's not effective, there is no justification in banning them? I, th I think it is disputed whether or not they are effective. Uh, the, the manufacturers um, on their website will give you as much evidence as they wish about how valuable mosquito devices have been to individuals and uh, to small businesses. So. I think there is, there's no question that they are effective. However, last month, uh, Sadiq Khan was re very relieved to be able to announce that he'd sold off the three water cannons acquired by his predecessor. 
The water cannons weren't sold off because anyone disputed that they were effective. It was because there were serious moral concerns and safety concerns as to their usage. And I think it is exactly the same with mosquito devices. I think there is, uh, there is limited dispute as to how effective they are. I, I think in many cases, they do succeed at dispelling young people from an area. Um, however, um, we don't consider that that end, or we don't consider that, that end justifies the means the mosquito devices use. Can I, can I come? You just says they um, they dispel young people from an area, and how do you, what do you say to residents who have suffered years of antisocial behaviour and a private operator puts one in, and for the first time they actually get relief in years? Um, so are they not being effective? Our response is and has always been that antisocial behaviour is not a justification for the use of a device which breaches four separate rights under the European Convention. SYP favours a mature response to antisocial behaviour, including improved youth work and improved community policing. We do not accept that mosquito devices are an acceptable way to target antisocial behaviour. Okay. Do you make any distinction between public places and, and private businesses? Because you could argue that a young person has to have the right to go to a train station or bus station because they want to they want to travel, but they, there's a different issue about them gathering around a, a private premises and maybe causing distress to the local community. Do you think there's a difference between locations? The rights-based and the health-based concerns are the same in all locations. One issue that we have had and this is, uh, for instance, exampled by the device at Lawburn Shopping Centre in Dumfries and Galloway, is that even if mosquito devices are privately operated, they can often intrude on public rights of way. So there is not necessarily a distinction between a device that is operated privately and that is operated publicly. In terms of rights of access, if you, if you said you have the right as a young person to go to um, use public transport, I can understand that but you're not obliged to go to a particular private premises. So if that is something that the, the proprietor regards as something to protect their property, protect the local community, that would be different because nobody has to go there. They're not accessing services there. That is true, but if you install a mosquito device on the outside of a corner shop, then anyone who walks past that corner shop is going to experience the mosquito. So you can't... You, you can't limit the effect of the mosquito device just to the private property. It's going to intrude on public space. So you believe there's now sufficient evidence um, that there are harmful effects of these devices, or do you accept that the research is actually pretty minimal and flawed and it would be better to have a, a more substantial research base before we expect the government to act? We believe that the medical research on the health impact of mosquito devices is limited and needs to be continued. We believe that the rights-based concerns alone are sufficient to justify a ban. Do you accept, I mean, perhaps being devil's advocate here, that the human rights of, of young people in a community who perhaps feel that they're being bullied and intimidated by um, not necessarily just young people, but people who are um, trying to control that community, sizing it by um, and social behaviour, do you accept there's a conflicting human right there? I will quote the Children and Young People's Commissioner when he spoke before the Scottish Youth Parliament when it last sat here at the Scottish Parliament. He said that rights are in no way contingent on responsibilities. They are absolute. We cannot get into a situation where we qualify rights based on certain circumstances. So while I accept that there is an issue posed by antisocial behaviour, and we need to tackle that. Antisocial behaviour does not justify the violation of rights. But you might argue on the other side, if your rights to live in peace in your community as a young person are being violated by groups who are intimidating and bullying you, you have the right to ask for support for that to happen. If we were to interpret the European Convention in a manner where the, the articles are consistent with one another, then we would reach the conclusion that one, 
that one should be able to protect these rights equally, there are other ways of preventing antisocial behaviour beyond the use of mosquito devices, as I've mentioned, youth work and community policing amongst them, and in even just increased security measures. So, sorry, would you support antisocial behaviour orders, rights to move people on? Um, while, again, due to uh, some limits to SYP policy on on how we believe that antisocial behaviour should be tackled, I'm slightly wary of answering what alternative mm. strategies we think should be used. But you would, However, but you, the Scottish Youth Parliament accept it is an issue, particularly for young people, of antisocial be behaviour by other young people. And therefore, that's not something that is a serious issue. It can't simply be dismissed. You can't simply say, well, that's not a concern. It would be about youth work. It would be about community policing. It would be enforcement of the law and so on which some young people might not be happy with. Absolutely. We do not for a moment suggest that antisocial behaviour is not a serious issue. Mm -hmm. However, the violation of rights posed by mosquito devices is also a very serious issue, mm -hmm. and the, the two must be balanced. OK. Thank you very much for that. Any final questions? I suppose uh, can be an as well. In the, in the way that the uh, local authority may choose to use a mosquito device, um, and use that as perhaps the device of last resort or the option of last resort. How is that, how is that decision made? Um, it's, it's just very interesting because if all other options have been used and that is a last resort, that doesn't take away from um, the petition and the petition's uh, aim. However, it actually could come to the point where um, if a local authority, it was the last point of last resort, I mean, I know they're asking for a ban, but actually, have all other options been um, looked at? It might also be that for some it might be the easy option. It's, it's like, well, we can't guarantee the police will turn up, we can't guarantee mm. there'll be youth work, you stick this device up, that at least mm. is resolved. Upon the equivalent of putting up an electric fence rather than sort mm. of trying to deal with people who are intruding on your property, I guess. Um, I, mean, I'm, I think people have found this very interesting. Thank you very much for your for your evidence and, and your responses to questions. Um, I'm interested in this question of competence around the legislation, because I think the previous uh, community safety minister was pretty firm on being opposed to it. But uh, I think on what basis would that be competent? I'm also interested in this question, regardless of my um, <clears throat> questioning around the rights of the varying rights within the community, this particular issue about young people with autism. And I think we should probably be writing to the, the various um, organisations that represent and support people with autism to see if they have a view on it. Anything else? Brian? Yeah, um, I'm frantically scribbling here. Um, I think it throws up quite a lot of, of, of uh, questions that we should be getting into. I think the, the, this, this suggestion that, that, that there's no evidence of any harm, I think we've heard today that there's, at the very least, there's anecdotal evidence of that. I think more importantly to me is there's there's no evidence that they're not harmful <laughs> to health, um, and that's linked into the fact that, that uh, we don't know how many there are. I don't think I was saying that gently as we, we were there with mobile phone masks for a long time trying to prove <coughs> a negative. But uh, but, but, but we, we, we've heard anecdotal evidence around that there is a, a and there is a, a, a harm. Uh, issue here, especially around uh, people with, with autism, and I think you can't ignore that. Um, I think that that's also linked to the fact is we don't know where they are, um, and there doesn't seem to be any, uh, uh, there's no register, uh, so how on earth can we make any kind of uh, uh, judgment around that? And I think it, it was kind of, I'd written it down as, uh, uh, at the same time as sort of Rachel Hamilton um, asked around this idea that that at least should be registered. The thing with, with mobile masks is we, knew, we all knew where they were. Um, but we don't know where these are. So, And, and, if, and fundamentally, it, uh, I think it prevents a section of the public from accessing public places. That's, that's the issue we have here, which, which, leads, which speaks to the human rights issue. So there's a whole number of things that, 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 get, that get thrown up here, I think. And, and I think it'd be interesting to see what, the, the, as you say, the Scottish Government said and, and maybe even you know police scotland whatever but um or, or even uh, cosla um but i we think want to contact scottish government police scotland um and cosla and i suppose the question there is to what extent they wrote across this and to what extent it's a failure of public policy that you have to put up a mosquito device mm -hmm. if communities feel that they're not properly 
protected from antisocial behaviour. Yeah. And, and of enforcement or antisocial behaviour orders could be deemed um, a, a breach of human rights as well. There are, you know, it's the way that the, the local authorities um, approach these situations. Um, I, I, I think we shouldn't take away from what the petitioner is asking. However, all the other um, points of discussion that we've um, brought up today are incredibly important. Okay. Um, anyone else we should be contacting? Angus? Um, no, not really. Just, well, just to say I agree that was... Um, Brian whether we should contact the government, Police Scotland and COSLA, but I was wondering if we could perhaps uh, assist the SYP in um, making reference when we write to the Scottish Government to the, the Ministry of Justice in Ireland's position uh, and also the views of the Council of Europe's um, stated, stated views, which might help uh, cut time down, you know, given that you, you, you haven't contacted the Scottish Government with regard to these issues. Um, we might be able to, okay. to do so for you. Is that agreed then? Okay. Just, Rachel? Um, just a little bit concerned that um, if we um, contact um, the National Autistic Society that we're missing out others um, with protected characteristics. I just don't know whether we should just be looking at... Um, well, I think we would hope that that could come through um, the Children and Young People's Commission and they would right. okay. cover that. Um, I think it's specifically um, groups with, you know, supporting groups, people with autism, that have flagged this up as an issue. Um, I don't think we know really about any of the other health consequences, but that would be something we would ask them to look at. Okay, in that case, can I thank you very much um, for your attendance and for uh, your evidence. We'll obviously um, get response from all these organisations that we're writing to, and you will have further opportunity to comment on those responses once they come in. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And can I suspend just for a couple of minutes? Um, the next petition for consideration is Petition 1711 on first aid training for all primary school children in Scotland, lodged by Stuart Callison on behalf of St Andrew's First Aid. The petition is calling for basic first aid to be incorporated as an integral part of the primary school curriculum and for the provision of funding to deliver high quality training materials with appropriate training for teachers. The briefing prepared by Spice and the Clarks outlines the current curriculum requirements within the Scottish Government's policy framework. It also refers to Scottish Government's out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, a strategy for Scotland, published in 2015 and discussed previously by this committee when we heard evidence on petition 1707 on public access defibrillators. 
The briefing also refers to two members' business debates which have been held on this issue, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. If I can maybe kick off, I've had some um, dealings with St Andrew's First Aid and um, this whole issue about the importance of the skill in life is something that I had not really thought about um, fully before, but I'm absolutely convinced that all our young people should learn um, first aid. One of the things that came out of the evidence of the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest issue was that not only are people in poorer communities disproportionately likely to have a, a cardiac arrest, they're disproportionately unlikely to have somebody around about them that can help them. And it's such a basic thing. Um, my office has now been first aid trained, and I'm certainly you know, pressing with the Scotch Parliament that we should all have access to this training because literally you can save a life. So I, I, I feel quite strongly about it and about the important work that St Andrews First Aid and others do with their volunteers to actually support community events and so on. Um, so I suppose I'm declaring an interest at the beginning, but I'd be interested in people's views. Brian? Yeah, <coughs> I'm thinking, because uh, I've got a fantastic memory, I can remember my school days, um, which is many days, we, we did this. You know, this was something that we that, that was routinely done with, with lots of other things that, that have been dropped, seem to have been dropped out of the curriculum. But I think it's something that is, as you say, it's a, it's a life skill um, uh, and, and something that... Uh, well, yeah, it was something different in, in the school day, and uh, it, it is quite it's quite empowering in, uh, to, to be you know, to be able to do that. I, I have a lot of sympathy for this uh, for this uh, 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 this petition. I, I cannot remember my school days, um, <laughs> but what I do remember is that um, we did accident prevention and first aid in the guides, and it was like the the, the, the youth organisations that did a lot of that. Whether they're the, the, I am sure they still do that, but that's not getting the same kind of level of coverage. Rachel, I'm sure. Um, Brian Whistle had lots of time to reflect when he was daydreaming at school. <laughs> but uh, the, I wondered actually, this fits so beautifully with the access to defibs um, in public places. Um, it's almost like it, it's kind of linking together. Um, it's unfortunate that it's kind of not running. Well, it will run in tandem, but it's not running together. Um, and I, I also um, had some thoughts because obviously through the curriculum of excellence it's up to the, the, the schools to decide you know, what they put as part of their health and safety, as um, part of their, um, uh, for example, knife crime awareness, these types of things. Um, and it very much uh, up to uh, you know, the school how they t take something like this forward. But I wondered, you know, having my own business, we have to have an assessment of first aiders within um, a, a business, our business. We have to have uh, ongoing um, assessments. And I just wondered if, if it would be uh, a good point to actually work out within a school currently how many people at one time, including the young people, are actually qualified in um, first aid. Because if you look at all the groups that do this, in terms of uh, groups like the Scouts, um, if you're doing your Duke of Edinburgh Awards, you're doing these first aid um, uh, qualifications. Um, it's important that in every class that you know there is a certain number of people available and within the building at one time to be able to administer um, CPR. Um, I think uh, looking at it from a blanket approach um, is fantastic, but is it is it age limited? Um, you know, there's lots and lots of questions that are thrown up here, and I think it very much depends on the school. I'm quite struck by the kind of rational approach by the petition because, first of all, it's identifying this problem that you're disproportionately likely to ha to need first aid support in a poor community. You're less likely to have somebody around about you that can help you, and so they're targeting. Um, disadvantaged communities first and working through and they're also targeting primary age children because it's a skill that they can all learn um, rather than it being by accident you know where you happen to be and it is, I think there's a distinction too it is CPR but it's more than CPR it's more broadly first aid which I think people focus on CPR understand that's a, a big thing and that's why it links with defibrillators and knowing you don't have to be afraid of these machines and you should use them if they're there 
um, and they should be registered and all the rest. All these things are, all of these things are trying to make people safe when if they if they if they become ill. But it feels that this suggestion is quite systematic, and it's saying there's not a school in the world I don't think wouldn't want to give their young people these skills. But do they have the training? Do they have access to the materials? You know, the, the more they're given the more likely the school is going to find a space in the curriculum. If they've got to design the course themselves first, they're less likely to do that. <coughs> David? Um, thank you, convener. I'll just put on, put on record, I'm a member of the Scout Association. Um, these skills are taught to all uniform sections, and as children as young as six, which is beaver section, within the Scout uniform section, so they're life skills that they're going to have. And I'm fully supportive of this because they do make a big difference because I have seen them used in real life by people who have been taught them. So. I mean, I think one of the things, I mean, obviously we haven't had the petitioners in front of us, but I think we're quite interested um, in hearing from them about why they've made decision, this particular issue around um, children, how inconsistency and so on. And perhaps, I mean, my understanding is that they would want to bring evidence from their volunteers about the, the difference they have made. So that's maybe something that we could see if we could um, schedule in, in the new year. Um, in terms of, I think, again, like the petition, as Rachel said, on defibrillators, there is, a, there is an interest here because it feels rational and logical and sensible to give people these skills because literally can save a life. Um, so I think a sense the committee would, would support that. So we could be right to Scottish Government and local authorities asking for their views on on the action called for in the petition. Is it doable? Is it the way that they would want to approach? Is there anything else we could do at this time? Well, um, I think it's important, but my point about, the, about writing to local authorities, but my point about the actual bespoke stuff that they do within schools, I don't think the local authorities might actually have a handle on some of the good work that perhaps the teachers do on a voluntary basis or other organisations and how many people are involved in that. I think this is a wider uh, kind of deep dive into actually uh, assessing what schools are currently doing. And I, I'm not sure if, although the local authorities will give us um, you know, their, their guidance of what they do. I'm not sure if that's going to bring back mm -hmm. exactly what we want to see, which is absolutely um, you know, key to this. Well, perhaps well, that's one of the things we could ask St Andrew's First Aid, the extent to which, in their experience, it, you know, what is the coverage? And I know that they have all sorts of age groups there. I think they call them the thistles. It's the wee ones who were actually in the Parliament. On one occasion, they were um, teaching us all how to do CPR, so it would be interesting to know from them their sense of what the pattern is. I suppose I'm reluctant at this stage. You couldn't possibly... It would be hard, hard to survey schools to ask them what they do in, in, just in terms of the amount of time that would take for them to, to respond to that. But, but on a, from a health and safety point of view, on a daily basis, a school should absolutely know um, how many people within a building mm -hmm. are um, first aid trained yeah, no, because you're, that's, yeah. you know, no, you're and right. including mm -hmm. um, young people who perhaps are in a situation where a teacher is unavail unavailable mm -hmm. to administer first mm -hmm. aid and a, and a pupil then takes. I think that there is a distinction to be made, which I suppose I was conscious of <coughs> that when I first asked about first aid training, for example, in the Parliament, obviously. They said, well, you can identify who the first aid is, either person is in your corridor or whatever. That wasn't really the question I was asking. It was, to what extent could we all do this if we were put in that situation? It's not the, the named person within a particular institution. It's more about how you then permeate that through communities as well. We, we discussed the um, uh, defibrillators. It was that the question came to my mind, where's our nearest one? Yeah. Which I now know. I think that that whole idea of, of that, that dissemination of information and, and you know is, is something that, uh, that this raises as well. Yeah. I need people to respond <coughs> so that it's not just whoever the name person is. But yeah. I think there's, there's quite a, a lot there. I, I would, as I said, be interested in hearing from St Andrews First Aid themselves. But I think if we're writing to Scottish government and local authorities, um, and you know, it may be we, sh we could be asking the local authorities to what extent do they map with their schools and other institutions the kind of not just the, the legislative requirement to have a named person but beyond that understanding who has those skills in their in their institutions 
Is that agreed then? Okay, so um, we want to thank the petitioner for the petition. Obviously, we'll get the responses back and we would look to having a session with them in the new year, but we recognise there are some very substantial issues here that we'd want to consider further. Okay. In that case, if we can move on. The next item on our agenda is the consideration of continued petitions. The next petition for consideration is petition 1652 by Irene Bailey on abusive and threatening communication. This petition, which we last considered in November 2017, calls for a change in the law with regard to abusive and threatening communications sent from a mobile phone to deem the owner of the phone responsible for any communications sent from that device. The clerk's note provides a summary of the current position following Lord Brackadale's review of hate crime legislation in Scotland and a subsequent debate held in the Parliament in June 2018. The Scottish Government has recently launched its consultation on Lord Brackadale's recommendations and the consultation closed, closes on the 24th of February 2019. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Um, well, I think there's some merit in uh, waiting for the conclusion of the uh, consultation. Um, I mean, I would certainly be loath to, to close the petition at this time. Um, I think we should um, wait until uh, the conclusions. Uh, well, we, I mean, we, we, we. I think we should contact the Scottish Government in the first instance to, to, to seek uh, information on whether con conclusions in the Brackadale review address the call for action on the petition. Um, I mean, clearly, uh, the, the petitioner has has a, a valid. A valid argument here, and I think you know it's maybe fair to say that we've all been subject to some of it in our in in this uh, occupation. So, um, uh, you know, I have a lot of sympathy with the petition. Mm -hmm. Rachel, um, it was very interesting what Lord Brackadale said, and um, the the need to, um, particularly with online activity, to prove uh, who had sent mes messages to um, the requirement for corroboration. Um, and, and he specifically said that that posed challenges, but um, it then goes on to um, state that actually the question of whether corroboration should be abolished generally and whether any safeguards would be needed if that would happen is currently with ministers. So it really is important uh, that uh, we don't close this petition until there is further consideration um, within the consultation and ministers have given, been given the opportunity to uh, comment um, specifically, I think that we would want to, to to be highlighting to the Scottish government that this particular instance we're not very cl we're not clear if it's actually going to be addressed in any detail, but we want them to be um, alive to it. I mean, I'm quite interested in what would happen in similar circumstances in other parts of the United Kingdom, because you could see the logic of it looks like you know consistent behaviour over time from one mobile phone to your mobile phone that the person could be deemed to be responsible. However, it might be possible that somebody else has taken your phone from you, is coercive towards you, and is using your mobile phone to send messages to somebody else. Um, and you would then be liable for that. So I think I'm very sympathetic to the, the, the petitioner's case. But I suppose what we're trying to tease out is what bit of this is Scots law that's the issue, and what bit of it is this is a complicated crime, and which is a difficult one to deal with. Um, but are we agreed that we wouldn't close the petition until such time as we get, um, until you know, also the consultation is closed, and we would write to Scottish Government in, in regard to the issues that we've highlighted? Angus? Um, well, yeah, just to say, I mean, clearly the corroboration issue is the, is the, the, the salient point in all of this, but um, I, I think I think we're still waiting uh, on the petitioner to comment on, on the final report of the, the independent review. And it would be good to, to get the petitioner's yes, view on that. Would, that would be very useful as well. Okay. okay, is that agreed? Okay, in that case, can I again thank the petitioner? And if the, um, she does wish to respond to the final report, we will be very interested to hear her views. If we can now move on then to the next continued petition for consideration, which is Petition 1693, an independent water ombudsman by Graham Harvey on behalf of Lowland Canals Association. We first considered this petition in September and the clerk's note summarises submissions received following that meeting. 
The submissions from the Inland Waterways Association and the Royal Yachting Association Scotland express some support for the establishment of an independent water ombudsman, as called for in the petition. The Inland Waterways Association expressed its support on the basis that the waterway ombudsman essentially carried out that function between 2005 and 2012. The Royal Yachting Association considers that there's an argument for the establishment of an independent water ombudsman with a broader remit than that proposed in the petition. Both submissions consider that current Scottish Government funding is not sufficient for Scottish canals to efficiently carry out its functions. The Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity addresses these concerns in his submission, highlighting additional funding that has been provided to Scottish Canals in recent years. Scottish Canals and the Scottish Waterways Trust do not support the action called for in the petition on the basis it will result in an additional layer of regulation and is not the best use of public money at this time. The Cabinet Secretary indicates that the Scottish Government does not consider the establishment of an independent ombudsman to be the most appropriate way to address the petitioner's concerns. He adds that while no specific cost analysis has been undertaken, there is likely to be a significant resource required to set up and run such a body. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Richard. Very difficult, convener, because um, there's so many conflicting uh, pieces of evidence. Um, for example, uh, the Scottish Public Service Om Ombudsman had said that it's not the best use of public money to have a water om ombudsman. Um, however, then the Royal Yachting Association um, want an ombudsman. So I, I, I think it's a very difficult one. There's, there's, a clear, um, there's a clear concern that public money has been wasted, particularly over the Millennium Link project. Um, I was also interested in what Audit Scotland had to say, which um, they plan to consider potential risks um, further in their 1819 external uh, audit alongside how Scottish Canal continue to fulfil its statutory obligations. I think we are quite a long way off getting to a conclusion on this, which is a shame because actually the main issue is the uh, detrimental um, fallout to tourism um, and the maintenance issue. So, uh, I, I mean, I'd be interested to hear from other members what they think we, you know, where we take this, because mm -hmm. it, I think we're a long way off concluding on this. I mean, my sense was that people thought there was a problem and the suggestion of the ombudsman was a way of addressing the problem. So even if you don't agree with it, it being an ombudsman, it still has to be a problem. I mean, there's a, <laughs> They're saying, oh, well, we, we have this constant wear and tear, Scottish Canal says, um, increased use, usage and all these reasons, and so um, they've got a queue of maintenance projects, but they're saying there's a repair backlog of £70 million. Pounds. They're also saying that there's the risk of collapse. Um, it's our opinion that Scottish Canals are close to the tipping point at which the successful regeneration achieved over many years is at a risk of collapse and the £98 million pounds of public money invested in the Millennium Link project wasted. So it feels to me that even if an ombudsman or whatever was going to cost money, it's not, it, it, it can't possibly be anywhere near a £70 million pounds repair backlog um, and the danger of, of losing all that, the benefit of all of that investment and having a canal and network that is in disrepair and it's not going to be able to do its benefit the tourism industry. Brian? Um, I mean, there's the £70 million pound backlog I'd uh, noted as well, and uh, I, I wondered whether or not um, there's a transport bill coming forward, am I, am I correct in that? Yes. And whether or not we should, yeah. we should feed, this, this should feed directly into the to the transport bill as well. At least, at least they highlighted this petition to them because it, it should fit in with the overall picture mm -hmm. uh, around transport. And and I think the worrying concern here is the amount of money that's going to be required to maintain or at least bring a, 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 a heritage issue back up to a standard that can be uh, used by those who mm -hmm. want to use it. It just feels like a false economy. I think we can certainly um, flag up the issue to um, the, on the bill, the rural committee um, on the, the transport bill itself. I suppose my sense is this overwhelming sense that 
public money is currently being wasted and the benefits of the strategy are being lost and there's a kind of a defensive approach. I mean, I feel the Scottish Canal is quite defensive. Oh, this is all very difficult. This is all very difficult and complicated and we wouldn't do that because it wouldn't work and we, there seems to be a lot of vague, you know, a vagueness about what actually the SPSO can do currently. They don't seem to be able to do terribly much. I'm also quite interested in this. I'm not quite sure which group says it, there should be a broader strategy. It should be about boating. It should be people who use water um, for leisure beyond just canals. I think there's that. I found that quite an interesting and, and you know compelling argument as well. Angus. Yeah. Thanks, convener. I think the um, the petition came about as a result of frustration. Uh, with Scottish canals, um, and the, in particular some bridges that have been that had been closed um, <coughs> on the the Forth and Clyde Canal, mm -hmm. um, and the problem was exacerbated uh, by a perception that Scottish canals weren't on top of the, their game. Um, now clearly Scottish canals have a number of challenges. Have been landed with this seventy million pound backlog. Um, but, um, and of course, the, the, the bridges are now being repaired thanks to uh, a lump sum that the Scottish Government's given Scottish canals to get it sorted. But, you know, that, that can't continue. There can't be a, a situation where you just stick a, a plaster on, on everything just mm -hmm. as and when it comes up. So, um, you know, I've got a lot of sympathy for, for the petition, but I, I can see the argument, though. Uh, regarding the, the cost of setting up a, a separate ombudsman, particularly when you look at the, the number of cases that have come in um, to the, uh, the SPSO to date. I mean, there's, there's just over, just around 10, I think, that they've dealt with. So, so there, there are cost issues there with regard to setting up another ombudsman. Um, but, uh, the, the, you know, there's clearly an argument for it. So mm -hmm. I would be keen to, to, to hear some more information from Scottish Canals, but possibly also uh, the Royal Yachting Association to get the different mm -hmm. uh, viewpoints on, on the setting up of a, a separate ombudsman. Rachel? I think there is uh, merit in what Angus has just suggested. And um, th we also think we need to tease out this um, can discourse about the fact that um, they have statutory obligations, um, Scottish Canals, and and they state the um, the Royal Yachting Association state that, and it was it was mentioned by the petitioner that the changing nature of the business from a canal body to increasing leisure business, and then the cabinet secretary comes back and um, says that Scottish government grant aid uh, cannot be used for commercial uh, investments. However, um, they want to. Uh, see how that develops in terms of the investment, the uh, return on investment that they've made, which I presume that they are going to then put forward to maintenance. But further on, um, that there seems to be a reference to uh, the, the wear and tear being obviously the usage, but also climate change. So we're adding in a new um, aspect here regarding climate change. Um, it does feel a bit like you don't have to give one explanation, just give as many as you can think of. <laughs> because some of, some of the issue must be that they have to try and develop surpluses through their commercial programme. And the argument from the petitioners was they've lost sight of their core business. They're going to could end up losing the benefit of all the investment around the Millennium Project and we're still not dealing with any kind of backlog, which must be just compounding over time. But I, th I think it would be useful to take evidence from... Scottish Canals, we should maybe think about who we would... I mean, obviously there's a number of submissions from other interested groups we may want to think about, hear from Scottish Canals and then maybe get a response from other groups thereafter. So, but, you know, I, I know members suggested particularly the Royal Yachting Association, but we can maybe look to see how, in conversation with them, how would that best look and how what would be the best fit for that. So if that uh, is agreed, um, we're going to continue the petition and recognise the important issues that are in there and want to thank everybody for the very substantial responses we got <coughs> from um, a number of organisations. If we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1701 by Nathan Sparling and changed the law to allow adoption of people over the age of 18. 
Members will recall we first considered this petition in September when we heard evidence from the petitioner. Submissions received to date are included in our meeting pack and are summarised in the clerk's note. The Adoption and Fostering Alliance and Adoption UK are broadly supportive of the action called for in the petition, although they do caveat their respective positions. The Adoption and Fostering Alliance indicates that the immediate priority should be in ensuring that current law should be made fit for purpose for children in the care system, while Adoption UK suggests that in terms of parental rights and responsibilities, any changes would be hollow in practice. In their joint submission, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the Minister for Older People and Equalities acknowledge the petitioner's motivation behind this petition, but consider that the current legal provisions strike an appropriate balance between the interests involved. They do not believe that the current law amounts to a breach of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights or of the Human Rights Act. The Law Society of Scotland summarises the current legal position, particularly in terms of parental rights and responsibilities and succession, and notes that there are options to mitigate the lack of legal status between two adults who consider themselves to be in a relationship akin to parent-child. It notes that there is no international consensus on this issue and that it would potentially be a significant change to the law, which should not be undertaken without further debate and research. It suggests such research should include a comparative study of the position in different jurisdictions. And I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. <clears throat> I was interested in knowing um, from the Scottish Government, they said um, they acknowledge the petitioner's motivation, but consider that the current legal provisions strike an appropriate balance between the interests involved. I don't know what interests are in conflict with each other that you're seeking a balance between them. I might be missing something there, but I wondered if that was something that we could pursue further with the Scottish Government. Other a group of people to, to whose, it would be to their detriment for this legislation to go through. I'm not quite sure why that would be. Well, Professor Norris says a similar thing, because he said um, that it depends on a balance of what the new law would achieve with the difficulty of achieving it. In my view, the complexities and costs far outweigh any potential benefit. Mm -hmm. But that's a different argument. That's well, saying it's, it's not worth it because it would, it would you know, cause a lot of yeah. fuss to have to do it. But what the Scottish Government is implying is there is a conflict of interest here and the current position seeks a balance between those two interests. But I don't know who it would be problematic for to have somebody else be permitted to be adopted by the person who brought them up, but they're adults when they do it. I don't know. I'm not sure what that conflict is. And it would be useful just to have that perhaps amplified. I get that the adoption organisation want to focus on young people, I understand that absolutely, but you know, for the legislation to say that um, adults could be adopted, whose interests would not be met by that? Was that the question I was wrestling with? Yeah. <laughs> I think the perspective could be, I'm trying to work out who would be harmed by this. You know, but on the flip side of that, this idea that uh, you know changes to adoption legislation would be hollowed, hollow in practice, is said by Adoption UK. And in terms of, do, 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 I'm trying to wrestle with that. Do we need legislation? And that's to to to. to I suppose the petitioner's argument was that they knew that they could get succession rights if you could write your will and all the rest of it. There was something significant emotionally, and in terms of what that relationship was for that to be recognised in law. Um, I suppose the argument from the lawmakers is whether an individual experience like that merits a change in the law, if it's going to have other consequences. I suppose I'm not quite clear what the other consequences are. I'd like somebody to tell me. Because mm -hmm. I'm assuming that you know, uh, the petition knew perfectly well, it was perfectly clear that yes, you could change the will and you could have succession rights, but still wanted to do this. So what was it? And we, I think at the time we found that quite compelling in, in terms of the evidence. I suppose, I suppose what we're asking is what would the harm be? And there must be, there is a, there's clearly a resistance to it, which isn't, I don't think, just because it's very complicated and we don't want to go there. I think that, I mean, the law obviously changes once a person reaches 18. Um, you know, not quite the same, but you know, related to one of the, the, the boys that I coach has just turned 18 and um, lives with foster carers. And that's a huge change uh, in, in the law. And I under, so I'd understand that there 
uh, an issue around that particular uh, that particular point. But in this, I'm failing to see where legislation comes into this. And I just say, and I'd like somebody to tell me, come in here and say, tell me what the downside is. Well, can I suggest that we are, the petitioner's not yet responded to submission, so it would be good to hear from him in terms of does that satisfy the kind of sense of commitment that you know publicly claim you're adopted? Is the idea that the law can do it in other ways sufficient? Um, but I also do think we should um, be going back to the Scottish Government and just asking them. What is this conflict of interest? What is this? What is the down? What do they perceive to be a downside that they, they feel they've got the right um, balance? And I think the law society suggests that we, we contact the, the law commission, so it might be worthwhile also doing that. See what their views are. The Scottish government um, say that the options currently available to adults are, are this sense of belonging, which allows those people to have a change of, of name, um, amend the official records and make arrangements for succession. So does that mean that the Scottish Government believe that there is already an informal um, option in place mm -hmm. and would be perhaps reticent to uh, take that forward? Yeah, I mean, if I suppose their view is... If it can be done that way, why do you need to do it this way? Why do you need to change the law? And I suppose that's what we would tease out from the petitioner. But also in the Scottish Government, like, if it wasn't a terribly complicated thing, you just do it, um, who, who would Tuesday that be? OK. OK, in that case, we, we are agreeing to write the Scottish Government, Scottish Law Commission and to ask a petitioner to respond to submissions received today and perhaps to respond to some of the comments that have been made in our discussion. Um, I just would like, um, if it's possible, um, to ask the clerks to, because um, I'm taking this in isolation, really, of, of what um, Professor Norrie said, um, that uh, when adoption was first introduced in Scott law, it did allow for adoption of adults, if only in lim limited circumstances. So. I'd like to know a little bit more about the background of that, because if that was possible, then why isn't it an option? Yeah, I think the other thing is perhaps to ask the Scottish Government for the response to the suggestion from the Law Society that we need research and that it would be interesting to get international comparisons. Maybe ask them if they have a, a view on that as well. OK, in that case, if we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1704 by Duncan McGilvery on improving targets and outcomes for autistic people in Scotland. The clerk's note provides a detailed summary of the submissions received since our first consideration of this petition in September. Those submissions are included in our meeting papers. Members have before them a copy of the petitioner's response to those submissions, and his response is also available on the petition webpage. In a submission, the petitioner states that he was, quote, very disheartened at the poor response from other stakeholders, noting that only 12 of the 32 local authorities responded to the committee's call for their views on the action called for in the petition. He adds that the content of those 12 responses highlights the great disparity across Scotland in the nature and quality of autism support and services. The petitioner also considers that some of the responses from local authorities were defensive. He notes how many of those who responded referred to assessment processes with promising titles, but that are vague and unclear on what they actually mean or entail, or indeed indication of their effectiveness. He considers that it must be acknowledged that views from service providers have a bias towards their own positive portrayal. The petitioner notes that a number of responses acknowledge that they are required to be real measurements of the impact of the Scottish Autism Strategy and considers that the provision of carer needs has been affected by the Carer Scotland Act 2016, which allows local authorities discretion to assess criteria for support. He refers to this as a subtle but highly significant change in supporting carers and families and has, in his experience, produced a reduction in support. The petitioner also highlights his concern that service users and autistic people appear to have a lack of voice. He provides an example of autism strategy events being scheduled in venues and at times that were prohibitive to parents, service users and carers being able to attend. He also makes an observation that where it was possible to attend events, these events were, quote, always top heavy with professionals. 
Other issues that the petitioner identifies in his submission are concerns that there are insufficient resources across local authorities to provide the required level of support, and this is exacerbated by a shortage of educational psychologists, as well as a lack of courses to increase numbers. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian. Yeah. Thank you, Kibina. I, I, I will declare an interest here in that um, of the couple of constituency uh, issues around this, this, this very, uh, the, the issues that this petition raises. And, you know, one of the things being a list is you work across a number of uh, constituencies and it is very evident that there's a complete disparity in how neighbouring uh, councils can, can uh, actually address this problem. And I've heard of uh, parents moving house and so, so they become when with another jurisdiction who have uh, a, a, a much a much tighter um, um, sort of investigation into kids with with potential uh, autism. And I think that um, it is a problem. I think the IS the, the one that the, the, the phrase that jumps out at me is the IS, IS's um, uh, submission inclusion without resources. And I think that. Uh, uh, this disparity in the way councils are, are, are approaching uh, the, sort of the ASL need uh, is something we, we, we are duty bound uh, to, to investigate because it has, as, as I've seen on in individual cases in constituencies, it has a major impact on, on individuals and families. And, uh, and I think it's, it's something that we, you know, I think you know, across the whole political spectrum, we would say it's something that has to be addressed. Angus? Yeah, um, I, I would certainly agree that there, there does seem to be a, an issue with regard to disparity across Scotland, but I have to agree with the petitioner on his, his uh, main point at the start of his submission, um, that it's not acceptable that only 12 of the 32 local authorities have bothered to respond to this petitions committee, uh, particularly on this issue. Um, and in fact, it, you know, it's unforgivable, really, and I would suggest that we contact the, the local authorities that haven't bothered to respond uh, and ask them again to give us a submission on the issue. Okay. I think that would be agreed. Just to get a, 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 a proper picture, I suppose, I was quite struck by, I think a lot of it was quite defensive, both from Scottish Government and local authorities, although well, it's all quite complicated and... Um, you can't just have this kind of assessment. In, in a sense, it's like an earlier petition that clearly there was a recognition that there's a problem here, but not necessarily the solutions as identified by the petitioner, particularly around um, an Autism Act. But I suppose we would want to tease some of, of that out further, but it would be um, interesting to know what the, the circumstances are across the country. I should also say that I sit in the Education Committee and we are also looking at the whole question of um, support for for young people in education um, with autism um, as a direct consequence of the report, which is not engaged, not involved, not empowered. It's and it's National Autism Society, Autism Scotland, and Children First to produce that with very strong evidence suggesting that young people are not have been able to access education because people round about them are not appropriately trained. Um, they might be on part-time timetables and, and, and other things because they're trying to be managed in mainstream, and I suppose, well, two things, to be managed in mainstream or where there's no longer appropriate specialist provision because of the presumption of mainstreaming, there kind of was a, almost like a double um, hit there, you know, that young people who, who can, who should be able to s be supported in mainstream are not supported sufficiently to do so and other young people for whom mainstream is not appropriate, but there's no longer an alternative um, provision. I think that is an issue to, um, I think that's a crash. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one other issue that, was, that, that I think we talk is, is this access to assessment? There's, you know, there's, there's a, in, in some councils, there's resistance to, to um, allow kids to be assessed. Uh, and, I th I, I, and then, then you go next door, uh, and, and that that they're, they're resistant to putting a time scale on assessment, which all just feels to me like they're having to manage a very limited resource. I mean, there isn't um, a, a, a small issue in a way, but a very significant one 
is um, around um, education psychologist courses. Now, we actually put an SSI through the Education Committee, which was around re-establishing the bursary for or financial support for people doing that qualification. But what we've been told by the EIS is that um, there was only one University of Scotland due to offer that training next year, and it's not going to be running the course, presumably because there wasn't enough demand. So they're not going to be replenished, people who'd be doing those kind of assessments in school um, any time soon. Rachel? I don't, I don't think it's unreasonable what the petition is asking for, that, for a diagnosis with them in a calendar year. Um, I, I was astounded that the National Autistic Society had said that well, through research they'd found that um, young people have to wait 3.6 years for diagnosis. I, I think there are a number of issues here um, and it, it runs parallel as well with the um, mental health service pathways. Uh, because it's the pathways and the, and the clarity within that. Um, there's no one size fits all, um, but it seems that there's no uh, clear guidelines within local authorities. Um, some people are just presuming that people with autism or uh, um, those people who believe that their children have autism are being seen um, appropriately within a certain time frame. There's no real evidence of that, and, and I would imagine that because there was a lack of um, um, input from many local authorities that they are unaware of uh, the timescale. I'm also struck by the different ways um, that different um, boards actually look at the pathways through perhaps the Learning Disability Service or, when appropriate, the, the Mental Health Service. So, um, first of all, where, what is the pathway? And then I think the time frame comes into it because you need to get the pathway right to, I know I said one size doesn't, uh, fits, doesn't fit all, but, and it has to be bespoke and there can be, but they perhaps need to be working together a little bit more those services because um, then the resources could be also used uh, um, collaboratively. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think there's a challenge in whether there's an assessment, whether there's then support follows the assessment, which is you know, a, a, an issue as well. Um, I, mean, I think in terms of writing to the Scottish Government, there's a number of issues. This is the question about the education psychologist. Um, would the Scottish Government commit to recording, publishing and monitoring autism diagnosis waiting times? Even that in itself might um, be helpful. Um, looking at the... you know what they've said about recognition that varying waiting times across Scotland are too long and should be improved, how would they want to do that? And this question about to what extent are schools, teachers supported sufficiently by support staff in order to meet um, additional support needs? And I think the other thing is it's not it's about training for everybody in the school community. Student teachers, you know, should have been initial training education, but also what training and support there is for people who work in schools with young people with autism. Is there anything else we could be... Am I mistaken from what you've highlighted? I just, I just wonder whether... Um, questioning the government on whether they believe that they're going to transform, committing, they're trans committing to transforming the lives of autistic people and they're committed to deliver those priorities by 2021. That's not very far away. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. from what we've seen here, they've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, and also Angus's point about we can go back to local authorities where we understand the pressures they're under, that it would be useful to get a sense of what their response is to our questions around this whole area. Okay. In that case, we've quite a substantial amount of work to do in that. Can I um, thank the petitioner for his further submission? I think that's given us a lot of um, to think about in terms of what has already been established. And obviously, we'll, we'll revisit this petition when we've had a response from the Scottish Government and hopefully from local authorities. Um, and with that, I think we've reached the, the end of the public session, just, I suppose, publicly, before we close, to thank the committee, um, all our petitions, people who have given evidence, people who have responded this year. We've had a substantial amount of work done this year and want to wish everybody a very happy Christmas and a peaceful New Year. And I'll close the formal part of the meeting. We'll go into private session. <laughs>